fresh off the implosion of her plans to create a little extremist caucus within the House GOP, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene is once again drawing sharp criticism for a tweet posted just hours after the verdict was announced in the Derek Chauvin murder trial. It claims that Black Lives Matter has, quote, proven itself to be the most powerful domestic terrorist organization in our country. That sparked a rebuke from the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney, telling Politico, quote, in her brief time as a Republican star, she's peddled QAnon-inspired conspiracies, promoted rhetoric that egged on the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, planned a white supremacist caucus in Congress, and tweeted a racist statement in the wake of the Derek Chauvin verdict. While Democrats are fighting for racial justice, Republicans continue to let Taylor Greene's disgraceful actions go unpunished. Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney of New York joins us now. Politico's Eugene Daniels is back with us. Um, Congressman, you could say that amplifying the most extreme member of the caucus might not be productive, but this whole caucus and its leader had a chance to say, we're not her and she's not us, and they passed on it. What do you make of the fact that that so emboldened her that she did this yesterday? That's the critical point. The point is whether... Voices like Marjorie Taylor Greene's are driving the decision making in the Republican caucus. And I'll tell you, there's proof that they are. The 199 Republicans voted to keep her on the Education Committee when they had a chance to do the right thing. Right. You know, they just took one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars from her because she's raising all the money. So, you know, the, the, the point is they are taking their cue from Marjorie Taylor Greene. They are taking their money from Marjorie Taylor Greene. And and that is the difference between trying to say there's a person saying crazy things and a whole political caucus, one major political party going down these dark roads of racism and white supremacy and, and conspiracy theories and all of the things we now know uh, she, she, she promotes. Well, and, and I guess you could just say, oh, they're just being crazy. Let them watch the 8 p.m. hour and just talk amongst themselves. But they're actually legislating at a really fast pace. I mean, we, we've covered for weeks now the voter suppression laws in 47 states, 108 of them in total. We've been talking today about laws to criminalize protest when all the violence really was on the right, right wing extremists. Ninety seven point seven percent of the Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful. So how do you it's, it's, it's no longer about just just dismantling the lies that falls to you and your colleagues in the Democratic Party. You now have to slow and stop the policymaking in response to the lies. How do you do that? Well, thank goodness we have the capacity in the United States Congress to continue to deliver for the American people. So while they seek to divide Americans, we are delivering for Americans. We are putting checks in people's pockets, shots in people's arms, hundreds of billions of dollars going to families who need it most. Middle class families trying to pay their health insurance premiums, trying to put food on the table, trying to keep their small business afloat. And yes, we have to combat the toxic and malign efforts of the other side to engage in voter suppression, to enact Jim Crow style racist voting laws all over the country, to engage in gerrymandering in this desperate hope that their extremism can still cobble together a majority in the House. But I'd rather be us than them. And, and I think one more point, we should not yeah. deceive ourselves that the politics of this can be difficult. But we are the party of John Lewis, right? We know that when we start to march across one of these bridges on the road to civil rights, there can be people on the other side with barking dogs and fire hoses and billy clubs. And it's our job not to just walk blindly into that, into that violence, but, but to understand the risks and to be smart about it so that we prevail and maintain the capacity to keep doing these good things that we're doing for the American people. I want to bring our friend Eugene Daniels into the conversation. He has a question for you, sir. Congressman, good to see you. Um, one of your colleagues has proposed to expel Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, and I guess I'm curious, should the House vote on that? You, you know, you've, talk, you've talked about and other Democrats have talked about how she's dangerous. I'm curious if you would support a bill to uh, propose to expel her from Congress. You know, I'm willing to look at that. I think the, this is an issue for the voters of that district to ask themselves why they would send this person to the Congress. But more broadly, I'm not going to take Kevin McCarthy off the hook when he should step up and take responsibility. If this was a member on our side, there would be consequences. And let's remember, in the past, they did discipline members like Steve King. So what's changed? 
Why do they now embrace a, a, a woman like Marjorie Taylor Greene when they give more, more, more criticism and more, more grief to someone like Liz Cheney, who, who committed the sin of saying the insurrection was wrong and Donald Trump had something to do with it? So I, I don't want to let them off the hook, Eugene. Um, I think they should take responsibility for this. Congressman, I want to um, get your reaction to both the verdict yesterday and uh, the attorney general's um, announcement today and the president's speech last night trying to um, make sure that the verdict doesn't supplement or, or replace any real action on the policy front around police reform. Right. Well, well, first of all, you know, I was there in the cloakroom with a lot of my colleagues watching the verdict. Uh, it was an extraordinary moment. Um, I read, Eugene, your reflection this morning. I think, I, think, I think people need to understand, first of all, that this is a lot. And there's a lot of people in our country who are trying to, trying to grapple with all of the emotions they're feeling. It's been a long year of waiting for this decision. And thank God there's accountability. But I think in the Democratic caucus, in the new Democratic majority, we are resolved that we have work to do that we have actions to take. And it starts with enacting into law the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act so that there are body cameras in more of these incidents and we can see what really happens. So that there are national standards and accreditation for police. So that there's a registry of misconduct. So that there are things like that the Justice Department can do when there is wrongdoing. In other words, practical reforms so that we elevate good policing and we isolate these incidents so that they stop happening because you know Dante Wright is 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 still uh, is still dead and and we know that until we Ryan. stop the violence then we have work to do that's that's where our heads are is that we have a responsibility to deliver now on real reform so um, Eugene the congressman mentioned your uh, reflections I'm going to read them now I hope this doesn't um, embarrass you you wrote this as the trial unfolded on TV the past several weeks we wondered whether the video recorded by a teenager named Darnella Frazier, that launched months of marches would be enough. As the verdict was read Tuesday, guilty on all counts, crowds outside the courthouse cheered and chanted. They and I felt a wave of relief. For a moment, I thought this could be a turning point for treatment of black people by police before being reminded that this is just one case and an extraordinary one at that, with nearly a 10-minute video of the crime, as well as the defendant's fellow police officers, including the chief of police, taking the stand to confirm that Chauvin violated department policies on the use of force. Um, how are you feeling today, 24 hours later, Eugene? Um, I think, <laughs> like, like most black people, the George Floyd murder was one that really shook me. And I think, um, you know, for it shook a lot of people all over the world, but for black people, it was this like reminder of every single, and I wrote this too, every single interaction we've, we've had with police, right? I, like four days after um, the murder, after watching it over and over, after having to report on it, after talking to every family member, after talking to my colleagues about it and explaining these kinds of things, why black people feel scared of police at times in these interactions, I woke up and I was, I like swept through my clothes. I was crying, I couldn't catch my breath. Um, and it is because the, the pressure of watching something like that and knowing that it could happen to you, right? Like, I have had interactions with police and my parents have always taught us, you know, you, you have to respect cops, but you have to move slowly when you're talking to them. Keep your hands at 10 and two. Say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Tell them where you're moving thing. Keep your wallet outside so you can hand, you can grab it. And so watching, you know, Derek Chauvin be convicted on all counts, it, it was this, you know, moment of relief. And I and I did have this this kind of thought that, you know, maybe now people will see how bad it is. But then, you know, 10 minute video, cops having to get on trial or get on um, the stand and against him, it, it doesn't seem that way. And I, I got there because a lot of activists that I talked to reminded me of that, that this is one case. Um, and so I think that I'm, you know, I'm still worried sometimes. I'm still scared. I, I live in Washington, D.C., and I've still been asked by police officers walking in my, you know, in Columbia Heights or in, in um, Eastern Market, where I used to live, what am I doing in this neighborhood? Um, a question that is none of their business, really. I am walking in my own neighborhood. And so um, that is the thing I think a lot of Black Americans are thinking about today and hopeful that, you know, Congress can do something hopeful 
that we continue to have these conversations because it's not just a policing issue. It's not just a legislative issue. It's a cultural issue. And that's what makes it so difficult and, and feel so overbearing at times. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.